Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nathan Shapura, political advisor at the European People's Party. And on behalf of the EPP, welcome to another episode of EPP Family Talks. Over the past two and a half months, we've had the privilege of welcoming leaders from throughout our political family to hear from them about the ideas and projects they've been working on. This afternoon, it is our great pleasure to welcome Mr. Radosław Sikorski, former foreign minister of Poland and the European Parliament's chair of the delegation for relations with the United States for a special focus on EU foreign and defense policy. Mr. Sikorski, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us this afternoon. My pleasure. Hello. For this interview series, we've been asking all of our leaders first to start off a simple question, and that is, in these past many weeks and months of pandemic, how have you been doing? How have you adapted? What's a typical day been like for you? Well, here in my part of Poland, um, we've had very little impact of the pandemic itself. Uh, we don't know anybody here uh, or, or among our neighbors, and nobody has had anybody who has been sick, uh, let alone um, uh, a victim. Uh, so it seems a little theoretical. Um, uh, so uh, thank God uh, we've we've been surviving rather well. Um, I, 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 I was just participating in the um, SEDE committee meeting. Um, just a few year, days ago, we were voting remotely in the European Parliament. Uh, I'm, of course, um, helping our candidate in Poland's presidential election. So this morning I was uh, affixing banners and, uh, and, and um, handing out leaflets in, in our local towns around here in Poland uh, because the first round of the vote is on Sunday. And it's, um, it's a very... Um, uh, it's a very lively um, campaign. Well, let me just pick up exactly on that point. Our, of course, our candidate, Civic Platform's candidate, Mr. Rafael Traskowski, mayor of Warsaw, is, is having a very strong campaign. Could you just give us an update and, and maybe tell us what the maybe the latest projections are? I know that's a dangerous question, but just how do, how do things look at the moment? Well, the incumbent, President Duda, is still leading in the polls, both in the first round and in most polls for the second round. Um, there are uh, several uh, opposition candidates, which means that uh, the first round is really the, a, a kind of um, pre-election, uh, a kind of primary. Um, and the election will be decided by the proportion of voters of the other opposition candidates, um, you know, where they will go, whether they will go overwhelmingly to Rafał, a former member of the European Parliament, uh, or, or whether some of them will go to, to, to President Duda. It's very difficult to tell because um, Poland is split down the middle, um, and opinion polls have been wrong in the past. I should also say Mr. Truskowski is also a former EPP vice president, and we wish him all the best and, and to your team all the best in these elections. Um, first of all, I also want to say a warm welcome to all of our viewers. We have a very strong following now live on Facebook. So thanks to all of you for joining us. So let's move now to talking about EU policy. And the first question I wanted to ask you about was on Eastern Partnership Policy. You're one of the founders of this policy. Ten years ago, Poland, along with Sweden, initiated the Eastern Partnership, and now you're the European Parliament's rapporteur on this file. Of course, last week there was the seventh Eastern Partnership Leaders Meeting. My question would be, looking back at this Leaders Meeting, but looking back really over these past 10 years, how would you evaluate the Eastern Partnership? What were your expectations then? What has changed? How do you see this going forward now? Well, look, if in if you told me in 2008, when we first proposed it, uh, to the then General Affairs Council, <laughs> that 12 years on, um, th there would be deep and comprehensive free trade uh, agreements with three of the uh, six uh, members, that three, the same three, Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia will have visa-free uh, access to, to the EU, that thousands of um, uh, students from those countries will be studying in Europe, uh, that will be spending well over a billion euros annually on, on Eastern Partnership programs, uh, and that we will be seeking to uh, expand Eastern Partnership into new areas, such as uh, 
uh, Rome as at home, uh, or even ar areas to do with um, cybersecurity. I would have said then, wow, that would be great. Um, and, and it's reality. Um, particularly, I think it's particularly good if you compare it to um, the other neighborhood. In the southern neighborhood, the Union for Mediterranean is twice as old. Uh, and I don't think it has comparable achievements. So I'm, I'm well pleased. So I think my understanding is you're also, well, as I mentioned, rapporteur for this file in the European Parliament and the AFED committee, the Committee for Foreign Affairs is preparing a report on this, which you're, which you're leading the way on. What should be this report's main messages or what will the, the main messages of this report be? Well, I think we need to reinforce the message of more for more that the more uh, those, those neighboring countries of, of the EU do for themselves in the cause of reform, the more we can help them approximate to our standards and integrate them economically uh, with the European Union. And I would add personally, prepare them for a possible future membership. And maybe one final point, one final question on the Eastern Partnership. And that's to do with the security component of the relationship between the Eastern Partnership and the European Union. This is not an issue without controversy. Some in the European Union, for example, President Macron, don't see a security architecture for Europe that doesn't include Russia. What is your opinion on this? How, how can the security element of the European Union with the Eastern Partnership be strengthened? Well, it's a tough issue because, of course, there are... Um, conflicting interests and conflicts among the Eastern partners themselves. Um, but Eastern partnership is, is, in, is useful because it's, I think, one of the few fora, perhaps the only one, in which Armenia and, and Azerbaijan talk to one another. Um, I, Russia is an important country. Um, if Russia wasn't invading other countries, uh, we would be much further along in in um, uh, collaborating with Russia. So, you know, that we cannot condone. But on the other hand, if the main organizing principle of the 21st century is going to be the Sino-American uh, rivalry for, for world primacy, then, of course, where Russia stands in that um, conflict uh, is very important, particularly... Uh, quite frankly, much more important for Poland than for France, because we are a neighbor of Russia and we are not a nuclear power. Um, we would much rather Russia to be on, on the side of the West. Well, you mentioned the Sino-American rivalry, so let's transition to talking about transatlantic relations. As I mentioned in, your, in the introduction, you're also chair for the European Parliament's delegation for relations with the United States. And there are a whole host of issues on the table, of course, in transatlantic relations, trade, response to the COVID pandemic, digital tax, uh, common, common defense, relations with China, indeed. Just a, first a general question, what would you say are the main priorities now for how to strengthen the transatlantic relationship? Well, uh, President Trump is no longer describing us as a foe. That's something. Um, the administration is now seeking to persuade us to uh, forge a common common front on some of the issues to do with China. Uh, and on some of those, I think we have interests that overlap. For example, uh, China fulfilling WTO uh, conditions of a market economy, China um, y y using ethical and uh, standards in, uh, in experimenting with drugs or with DNA manipulation and so on, um, uh, on human rights, obviously, on Hong Kong. Um, uh, but, but the U.S. also has the security dimension. The U.S. has uh, actual treaty allies in the immediate neighborhood of China. And that's, of course, we don't. And, and that, you know, changes the perspective. So I think the challenge for us is to uh, work with the United States where uh, where it's in our interest and where we can bring something to bear um, without being drawn into a military confrontation. So, of course, as you mentioned, one of the cornerstones of the transatlantic relationship is defense and, and, and the NATO architecture specifically. 
EPP has been unequivocal in supporting this, um, at the same time also supporting a greater European capacity for European defense. So on this question, on this point of European capacity, one of the things under discussion now in the context of the next MFF debate, multi-annual financial framework debate, has to do with the contributions, the, the, the European funding contributions for military mobility. And it looks like this is one of the things which will be cut. What is your view on this? What is well, the I'm, I'm very disappointed by this because, look, the, um, it's the wrong lesson to draw from the COVID pandemic. The COVID pandemic surprised us. Uh, we, as Europe, and also uh, as some member states, were unprepared. Well, that's what you develop defense capabilities for, for those things that you cannot predict. And we shouldn't be caught uh, unprepared. In fact, um, the case for uh, stronger European collaboration is strengthened by the pandemic because we waste a lot of money on, on duplicating defense uh, programs. It's been calculated that um, 100 billion euros annually is misspent through non-collaboration. So if money is tighter than before, that's an argument to, to collaborate more, not less. And also it's a reminder that the unexpected does happen. And, you know, uh, people draw the lessons from the experience of two world wars. Some people draw the lesson of pacifism. We in Poland don't take any lectures about the consequences of the Second World War because we um, uh, were very uh, harshly treated during both world wars. And our lesson is different, namely that every country has a, an army, either your own or a foreign one. Uh, your own in the longer run is cheaper. And therefore, uh, but, but we also see that Poland being a flank country uh, spends more per capita uh, and on uh, uh, as a proportion of GDP than those countries that are surrounded by friends. Well, it's very nice for them. Um, but we are therefore providing security, uh, flank security um, for countries that are richer than ourselves. And I think um, it would be better to uh, finance more activities from a common fund so that the job can be done better and so that the burden could be shared more fairly. Let me just follow up with two specific concrete examples to follow up on what you've just been talking about. One of them is EU battle groups and the other one is PESCO, a permanent structured cooperation. So first, maybe on the battle groups. Could you explain maybe what exactly this is, this concept, and why this is important in addressing a, a potential for crisis management at the EU level? It was originally a British idea conceived uh, 20 years ago, namely that we would have a rotating brigade on standby composed of um, battalions, uh, three, one battalion each for three countries uh, being on standby for six months. Um, and in, in principle, it's a nice idea, but in practice, um, the, no, no battle group has ever been used because it's based on the same concept as, as at NATO, namely that those who contribute the forces also pay for them. And it means that there is a powerful disincentive for countries to volunteer for action because not only are you risking your soldiers, you also, you also end up out of pocket. Um, so I think we should, uh, you know, if Europe were to decide to use a brigade in some emergency or in peacekeeping or, or whatever, then Europe should also pay for it. Um, otherwise, I'm afraid we will never find volunteer countries to, 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 to carry the burden. So I have personally proposed a, a reform of the battle group concept. I think a brigade is a good idea, uh, and it should be multinational, uh, but in a different sense. I'd like to see a unit, a, a brigade, that is drawn from volunteers from member states and is actually uh, on a permanent uh, uh, standby under the authority of, uh, of the Foreign Affairs Council 
and financed from the EU defense budget, from the peace fund for operations and from other funds um, uh, when it's not in action. Uh, but, you know, defense is expensive. And therefore, I'm very disappointed that the original commission proposals, which were, which were modest, you know, 13 billion for a whole continent over seven years is a tiny proportion of what uh, we spend as member states. Um, so uh, I've been contributing uh, amendments and, um, and I'm uh, just um, writing a PESCO report where I'll be flashing out this, this idea of a, of a reform of the battle group concept. Well, you just mentioned PESCO, and that was my next question. Permanent structured cooperation. Could you explain for any of our viewers who might not know what exactly this means and, and maybe how this other idea that you proposed regarding the battle groups fits into this con con concept and how also maybe PESCO helps with the efficiency is issue you also mentioned, how there's so many different, different systems, et cetera, which don't necessarily work efficiently across Europe and lead to a lot of waste. A permanent structured uh, cooperation in the area of defense, uh, uh, voluntary, was envisaged in the Lisbon Treaty. And the uh, letter of uh, foreign ministers um, uh, was initiated in this house um, when, uh, during the Polish presidency, with the then um, um, foreign minister of France, Bernard Kushner. We wrote to Cathy Ashton to... Uh, to launch uh, PESCO, which is to say, um, uh, um, fulfill the treaty, but we had a different idea how it should be done. We wanted it to be an elite group, a vanguard group of countries that truly want to um, synchronize their procurement, uh, to agree common rules of engagement, uh, and to truly uh, 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 delegate troops under a European command. Um, I'm afraid the, the, the PESCO that's been um, uh, declared now is a different animal, uh, a, a sort of lowest common denominator thing where, where everybody belongs and, uh, a, 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 and, and nothing ambitious has yet happened. Um, so I would urge um, uh, member states to be bolder in interpreting the PESCO concept. I want to follow up on this and ask again a more general question about transatlantic relations having to do with things like PESCO, with things like the battle group concept, which you mentioned. Sometimes I think on the U.S. side, there's concern that these ideas in Europe, these, these EU ideas would somehow undermine NATO and not complement it. What would your message be to counterparts on the U.S. side? Look, Europe will not be capable of uh, doing the kind of job that NATO does for decades. Let's be honest with ourselves. Um, uh, the most that Europe can ho hope to achieve within a decade or so would be to stabilize its own uh, neighborhood. Say something bad happens or something worse happens in Libya. And... If that were to happen, we we should be able to uh, do it ourselves without always calling on the Americans. And and I think the Americans, and many of them do, understand that it would be um, our burden sharing. You know, they they are a global superpower, but they don't want to, to do it for us in every emergency, just like we wouldn't help them uh, in on, on their southern border. Right? We are the largest economy on earth. We should be able to protect at least our borders. Um, so, so I think in this, it's, it's completely compatible with NATO because NATO is indispensable for the eastern flank. What the Americans uh, really worry about is that if we um, specialize, if we uh, um, increase the uh, proportion of <coughs> European-made equipment, uh, in our armory, then their companies will get a smaller share of the pie. But, you know, their share of the pie is so huge. And if I get my way, the pie would get bigger that we would we could we could both benefit. 
Mr. Sikorsky, thank you so much for sharing your perspective, your ideas with us. I have another question, a final question, a more impersonal question, excuse me, a more personal, more informal question to ask. Uh, and that is, this is a perfect setting, I think, to ask it in, given that you're in such a beautiful home library there. Do you have a book, uh, a favorite book, or maybe a book you've recently encountered, which you would recommend recommend to our viewers? Maybe more I would heartily recommend a new biography of Napoleon by Adam Zamoyski. Uh, I, I, I know a lot about Napoleon, but he's uh, brilliant in showing that in his first 10 years of, in office, most of Napoleon's decisions uh, bordered on genius. In his second 10 years in office, most of them were wrong which I think is a nice argument for terms of office and for democracy. And is there, not to put you on the spot, but was there a turning point or some sort of a, a determining factor which sort of meant that the second 10 years were wrong, whereas the first 10 years had been genius? People start uh, um, playing for prestige. Um, people people's uh, um, uh, people's associates stop telling the leader the tr the hard truth um so your the quality of your information goes down um and you start taking things for granted the british yeah. have a the british have a saying after 8 years every prime minister goes mad <laughs> well uh, i think a very uh, thank you for the recommendation and a very fitting um, a fitting one and a, and, a, and, a, and a good warning for us to heed, I think, as well. So, Mr. Radosław Sikorski, former foreign minister of Poland, the European Parliament's chair of the delegation for relations with the United States. Thank you so much for taking the time. To My speak pleasure. On behalf of the EPP, thanks for the good work that you're doing. Thanks. Be healthy. <laughs> you too, to you as well. To all of our viewers, thanks for joining us. Please tune in again next time. We'll have more episodes next week of our EPP Family Talks. Have a great evening and see you then.